Okay, so I'm Christina Kennett Brophy. I'm the chief curator of the New Bedford Whaling Museum um, with a very long official title of the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the chief curator. But for the purposes of your interactions with me, just chief curator is fine. Um, so to, I know that you already have hopefully seen Bob's video of the biology section of the exhibition of whales today. But I just want to explain this in context and then discuss the actual collection of Watkins and Cheville. So downstairs is based on whale biology and ecology. The mezzanine is how do we know what we know about whales. And then the Turner Gallery goes into the human interaction with whales through whaling throughout time. But the most, one of the most important elements of the mezzanine is the Watkins Cheville collection, which is one of the most extraordinary gifts the museum has gotten in the last few years. Um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is one of our most important members in terms of whale biology um, and ocean health uh, consultants. One of our board members is Michael Moore, who's a senior scientist there and a veterinarian of whales. He actually did the necropsies of several of the whales that we have hanging in the museum. So to give some context, William Watkins and William Cheville were the pioneers of marine mammal bioacoustics. Bill Cheville was a curator at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, and he also worked with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. But in the 40s, he was hired by the U.S. Navy to record um, what they thought were, ger were Russian submarines um, and find out what kind of... Um, submarines they're listening to for sure. And he realized after spending some time shipboard that they were actually listening to fin whales because they have this mechanical rhythmic kind of communication. So that led to a huge connection with the Navy, which has actually become part of this larger project, which is another conversation for another day. Um, he hired Bill, Sh Bill Watkins, who had just come back from living in Africa for most of his life. He's a, he was a linguist, he spoke 30 languages, and he was a radio engineer. So he created a radio station in Africa to cover lo long distances at a great, greatly reduced cost. Um, and he was just a genius in engineering and sound. So he wasn't a whale biologist at all, but he was a technical engineer of incredible um, skill. And so Cheville realized how difficult it was to tape mammals at sea because when you make any kind of a sound or disruption to, um, to the environment, the behavior of the whales is affected. So kind of like a squirrel freezes when it sees you, a whale will go silent or will otherwise change its behavior and communication. So Bill and Bill um, started working together in the 40s and 50s. Um, Watkins was quite a bit younger than Cheville. Um, and they worked together until Cheville died in the 90s, and then Bill Watkins died, um, in, I think, in 2000. But in that time, they made phenomenal leaps and bounds in tagging systems and bioacoustic recording and creation of instruments specifically designed to tape whales and other mammals at sea um, in their natural habitat. So. Watkins would actually take off the shelf equipment sometimes and modify it to suit the needs. Otherwise, he would just develop things directly from scratch. The instruments here um, are examples. We have an entire storeroom of these types of material downstairs in our facility. But these are examples of the types of equipment that they were using to record mammals at sea. Um, also, how they would play them back once they were back in the studio. So you'll see like almost everything is transportable. There are a couple of pieces in the final case in the middle that has um, even a first laptop that Watkins was using at sea, a very early development of that. Um, but you see when they were actually out recording, they weren't just recording, but they were also making sketches. They were taking photographs. Um, we have a selection of notebooks here from Watkins. We have hundreds of them downstairs of all of his little notes of all the places they went in the world and all the days of their travel. Um, we have their recorders. We have this wonderful thing that I like to point out to kids sometimes. This is like an early Google search. So you stick a pin through the cards for blue whales, for example, and it pulls up a bibli bibliography about blue whales that belong to Bill Cheville. So, um, so it's a way of searching in the old days, so kids kind of like that. Um, this is a very important ship, the Abel J, that was designed for Bill Watkins, um, according to his specifications, to be super silent and travel the world for bioacoustic research of marine mammals. So the engine was insulated. It had massive tanks for water and fuel, um, and so it could go long distances without having to stop. It could actually go from here to Antarctica without stopping. Um, and perhaps even further. But it is now actually a private vessel and is living in France. 
Um, there are also um, x-rays of specimens that Woods Hole had taken um, under Bill Cheville's guidance. Um, so some fun things to point out in this case. This is more of the product of what was made with some of these instruments and kind of what it led into. So whales were not considered important for conservation until they were given voices. Nobody understood how complicated their communication systems were, how individual they were to each species communicates in a different way for different reasons. Frequencies are different through various layers of viscosity of the ocean. So if you're a toothed whale, um, you tend to communicate more in clicks, so that melon in the head helps with that communication system for echolocation and for communication, but it tends to be in shorter bursts and shorter, sh shorter distances. Um, for baleen whales, like blue whales and finback whales, you can actually supposedly, according to Michael Moore, who is our expert, um, you can be a blue whale in San Diego and talk to a blue whale in Japan. The problem is, is that the bioacoustic interruptions from shipping traffic noise and other disturbances make it very difficult for these animals to communicate, and it's one of the major impacts on whales from human activity today. So blue whales and fin whales speak at a frequency that's so low human ears can't detect it, but if you could, it's, the sa sa it's as loud as a jet plane engine um, if you were able to hear within that frequency. And they speak very um, deeper in the water over long, um, lower frequencies that travels a longer distance. So what I'm showing you here, this is the first chart of whale sound recordings ever made, um, which were made by Bill Cheville and his wife, um, Barbara. And they were on their honeymoon in this river, the Saguenay River in Quebec. And they went out on a boat and recorded belugas for their honeymoon, which I think is hilarious and awesome. Um, and this is a picture here of Barbara Lawrence, his wife, working on recordings. And there's a picture there of Bill Cheville um, looking at a skull of a whale that he's trying to figure out exactly how the sound works within their head. These are the kinds of equipment on loan from Woods Hole that they used in that first recording. And you can see the plot fixes on the chart of exactly where they were. They made this album, we have several copies of this, but this is the original cut of those recordings um, of the beluga whale in Canada. This led into this album that was produced by Bill Cheville and Bill Watkins, which um, will actually be in the book as well. Um, and it talks about different species of whales that they had recorded together, and that was produced by Woods Hole. Because of their having given voices to whales in this way and people started to really um, anthropomorphize them and care about them, they became huge symbols of the conservation movement as well as um, civil rights movement and just sort of um, in the Vietnam era and um, became symbols of kind of the health of the world. Um, and they became to be associated with liberalism and hippies and all kinds of stuff. So you see a bunch of political campaign bumper stickers that we put here, um, which are pretty interesting um, historically. We have many others in the collection, but these are fun to show. Um, and then this really was a fabulous publication, National Geographic, from January 1979, of names that you probably are familiar with, Roger Payne and Katie Payne. And they made a, the album of Songs of the Humpback Whale. This is still the longest running and most successful natural recording ever made in history. And it was a little flexi disc that's inserted into National Geographic about whales. So it's really the first time many people in the public got to hear whales um, in this context of conservation and that they actually speak to each other and have this very complicated and quite beautiful language. Um, humpback whales are one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful whales to listen to. So this maybe made whales very popular. Um, they were in a Star Trek movie that sort of got whales into pop culture. There's, it's all about humpback whales. You have to see it. It's awesome. I have some of our um, younger people coming in and ask me what that is. <laughs> but it is a VHS type. Um, and then this is the album that was also made with Paul Winter to try to bring human music and symphony into whale sounds and have this collaboration between whales and musicians. Um, and then also, and there's some other stuff similar to that, but this is kind of a neat thing. We don't have a real copy of it, but this is the album that went off with the Voyager into space. And whales are on that from this Roger and Katie Payne recording. And Carl Sagan, the famous writer and theorist, um, actually organized this project. So it, it recorded sounds from all over the earth in case there was intelligent life found somewhere, they would listen to this album and hear what we sound like. Um, there is an animal section, but the whales are actually included in the, in the greeting section amongst humans, which is kind of a fascinating new take to that relationship of that animal.